So uh, this month we're going to talk about uh, uncomplicated spontaneous uh, deliveries, uh, specifically uncomplicated vaginal deliveries uh, in those circumstances when an EMS provider is not able to get to a pregnant lady to uh, labor and delivery uh, uh, in time for delivery at the hospital. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about also is appropriate uh, for those circumstances where uh, the mother may deliver the child before EMS arrives. So uh, why are we going to do this? Well, uh, we frequently have patients uh, who are pregnant and in labor, and we have to transport them to labor and delivery. Uh, sometimes, uh, despite our speed, uh, we don't quite make it to the hospital, and um, uh, the patient delivers either before we get there or uh, after uh, care is assumed by the EMS provider. So uh, I've heard uh, some questions recently regarding um, deliveries. We've also had a couple uh, cases where we had home deliveries, uh, which only don't always go as planned. Um, so I, I, I thought this was a timely talk based on what's been happening uh, within our uh, run, running districts. Um, this, for this talk, we're going to talk only about deliveries. Uh, we're not going to talk about physiology of pregnancy or any of the complications of pregnancy. Uh, it's my expectation that no, next month we'll talk about complications of pregnancy such as persistent bleeding, uh, abruptions, um, and uh, eclampsia or preeclampsia. So uh, before we get uh, into the actual delivery itself, let's talk about the stages of labor. Uh, there are three stages. Uh, the, f the first stage uh, it begins with the onset of labor pains, um, and it lasts until the cervix is fully dilated. Now, for EMS providers, uh, you're not going to know if the cervix is fully dilated because it, it's not uh, within our scope uh, to do vaginal exams to assess uh, for the uh, dilate, dilation of the cervix, um, but uh, that's how uh, the first stage is uh, mentioned or is defined. Uh, toward the end of this stage is when, often when the amniotic sac ruptures and the patient states their water broke or water breaks. Uh, that's when they may uh, see some bloody show. Uh, that's all part of the first stage. The second stage uh, begins uh, once the uh, cervix is fully effaced, uh, meaning it's fully opened, it's fully thinned out, uh, and the head of the baby starts to move into the uh, birth canal. Um, during this time, the fetus will undergo some position changes. Uh, typically, as the head of the baby drops down into the pelvis, um, the baby spins so that uh, when the patient's or the baby starts crowning, um, the head is uh, facing facing uh, toward the back of the mother, and it's the top of the head uh, that presents, and the face is, uh, is pointed in the direction of the uh, mother's back or rectal area. Uh, and then um, as uh, the uh, patient or the baby delivers, uh, the baby after the head is delivered tends to rotate to the right or to the left so that the face is going sideways. Uh, and then you have to deliver the shoulders. Uh, typically we deliver the top shoulder first because it tends to get hung up uh, uh, behind the uh, pelvic bones. And then uh, as we get that first shoulder delivered, uh, we'll get the second shoulder delivered and then the baby may spin as they come out. Uh, during the second stage of labor, uh, contractions become more intense and more frequent. Uh, they become uh, more uh, um, uh, uh, I say they, they are longer in duration, uh, more sustained is the word I was looking for. And uh, the second stage of labor is uh, concluded uh, once uh, the baby is fully delivered. The third stage of uh, labor uh, is during the, that stage uh, when the placenta is being uh, delivered. Um, so it's uh, from the moment the baby is born until the placenta is delivered. That is considered um, the third stage of labor. And during this phase, the uterine continues to crack, uh, contract uh, to uh, push the placenta out. And it's those contractions in, uh, of the, placenta, of the uh, uterus that uh, clamps down on uh, the blood vessels that are bleeding. And uh, that constriction of the blood vessels by the uterine muscles uh, cuts back and stops uh, the bleeding till, till it's barely uh, occurring. If we look at a graphic representation um, and um, you know uh, the stages of labor, how long they last, and compare uh, first pregnancy versus uh, pregnancy or a, a patient who's been pregnant more than once, uh, the first stage tends to last eight to twelve hours in the first timer. Uh, it tends to be shorter than that in the um, 
a patient who's at uh, multiparous, uh, or a patient who is multiparous, meaning they've had uh, more than one pregnancy. Uh, the second stage, the actual um, delivery of the baby, uh, can be hours, if not longer, for mom uh, if they're a first-time pregnancy. Uh, but if they've had uh, more than one pregnancy, it tends to last uh, 30 minutes or less. Um, and sometimes it's precipitous, meaning once the uh, cervix is dilated, uh, the baby moves along quickly. The thir third stage of labor can anywhere between five to 60 minutes, uh, regardless of um, um, the number of times the mother's been pregnant. And um, uh, what you may see actually in the uh, lady who's been pregnant uh, multiple times is the uterus may be distended and may not contract and constrict like it uh, would have done so with the first or even second pregnancy. Um, so that, that uh, duration of time that it can take to deliver the placenta can be five minutes or, or up to an hour. Uh, generally, after an hour, if they haven't delivered the placenta, the uh, uh, obstetrician gets concerned and may have to become more aggressive in getting that placenta delivered. So if you're uh, dealing with a pregnant patient, uh, how do we assess that patient? Um, and these are kind of my ideas. Uh, I think one of the f uh, things we need to consider is the patient's obstetrical history. You know, uh, what is their due date? How far along are they? Um, how many pregnancies have they had? Um, that first time, uh, or that lady with the first uh, pregnancy, it's going to take her longer to deliver that child. Um, and the, the uh, patient who's been uh, pregnant multiple times, uh, they're more likely to have a precipitous delivery where you may not have much time to get the patient to the hospital uh, and have the patient delivered. Uh, other things to consider about their obstetrical history are, are any complications, uh, particularly in terms of diabetes or preeclampsia. Um, always be aware of the uh, preeclamptic patient because they're at risk to develop eclampsia, which is the full-blown seizures. Uh, also, as part of the assessment, does the patient, does the patient have any uh, other chronic medical conditions that may go into play? Um, do they have a history of uh, DVT and they're now on anticoagulants, or do they have any other chronic medical condition that may be exacerbated by the pregnancy? We also need to know when the contractions started, uh, how long have the contractions been lasting, and how often do they have the contractions? Uh, because if they're coming long and hard and frequent, then uh, they're they're uh, probably closer to delivering than if they're having contractions every five to 10 minutes, they last uh, 30 seconds at a time. Um, also, we need to know what's the patient's hospital record because our goal should be to uh, hook that patient up with their obstetrician, uh, and we should do that unless the patients have some immediate event happening, such as a precipitous delivery or um, some complications such as eclampsia, in which case we ought to get them to the closest obstetrical hospital. Uh, it's also important to ask if the patient feels like they have to push or if they have a need to defecate um, because those uh, symptoms are suggestive that uh, the baby may be crowning or delivery may be imminent. And it's one of those circumstances where we would actually look under the sheets to uh, check the perineum and to see if there is crowning or evidence of uh, delivery. We should do our routine exam, paying attention to vital signs, uh, airway, um, uh, breathing and cardiac exam. Uh, we should obtain IV access. Uh, and uh, if you anticipate the delivery is um, imminent, uh, call for help. So it all depends on uh, what your uh, assignment may be on a uh, OB run. If it looks like a uh, delivery is imminent, um, you may need uh, help. So if you're a two-man medic and uh, delivery is imminent, uh, call for help early because you may need extra manpower in order to take care of the baby and the mother and to assist with the delivery. So uh, I think it's better to call early um, than to find out that you need help and uh, help's not on the way. So let's talk a little bit about assisting with delivery. Um, so our goal is to assist uh, the patient delivering the baby. Um, we're not going to do things to actively encourage uh, or facilitate the delivery. Um, we do not perform procedures such as episiotomies. Uh, our goal is to uh, help uh, mom safely deliver that baby uh, if the baby's gonna deliver uh, before you get to the hospital. So the first thing uh, is to make sure you use PPE, take care of yourself. Um, sometimes our deliveries are precipitous, but if you know deliveries in process, um, you know, get a gown on, uh, get gloves on, and get a face mask on uh, because um, you, know, you have the risk of being exposed to uh, blood and body fluids. Uh, so uh, think of yourself and put PPE on.
Um, as part of the assisting delivery, and, th and in this slide you can see the baby's head is already presented, but our goal is to control delivery so that the baby doesn't um, come out too fast. Um, we want to support the head as it emerges. Um, we want to uh, feel for the knuckle cord, meaning is the uh, umbilical cord wrapped around the baby's uh, neck. So once the head is presented, you kind of put your fingers um, uh, around the base of the neck, and if there's a cord present, then you unwrap it around the baby's head. Uh, and then we clear the airway by gentle suctioning with a bulb syringe. Um, you know, in years past, we've been very aggressive in suctioning, but uh, nowadays the recommendations are that we do some gentle suctioning if indicated, um, and we don't over suction because it uh, can stimulate um, uh, a vagal response and uh, bradycardia in the baby, particularly after the baby's delivered. <clears throat> we want to gently um, glide the head uh, out, and then once the head is out, the um, baby's going to rotate some so that you're going to have the shoulders running up and down and our goal then is to get that top shoulder delivered um, by gently uh, pulling downward on the head down toward the uh, patient's bottom that will help deliver that shoulder so once you get that top shoulder past um, the uh, pelvis past the symphysis pubis area generally uh, it's easy to get the baby out from there uh, but often the most difficult part in the baby delivery is getting them uh, getting that first shoulder out sometimes uh, in order to help get that top shoulder out uh, one of uh, your partners may have to uh, put some gentle pressure on the abdomen just above the symphysis to gently push the baby down and push that shoulder down uh, so you can again you can get underneath um, that pubic bone and get that shoulder delivered once you get that top shoulder delivered then you gently um, pull the head upwards uh, that'll help get the bottom shoulder out um, past the um past the perineum so you can get the rest of the body out. Um, as you do this, uh, and particularly as we're starting to deliver the head, uh, commonly we'll take one of our hands and gently uh, support uh, the uh, perineum um, to keep it from tearing too fast. Um, I've got a video coming up and you'll see that. Um, but uh, that helps uh, allow uh, the natural pressure of the baby to help stretch uh, the opening so that they can get out, a baby can come out with te without tearing. So sometimes if there's a major laceration of the perineum from the delivery, it's because the delivery went too fast. So uh, we've got the shoulders out. We're going to get the baby out. Uh, we try to keep the baby at about the same level as the vagina. Um, we uh, will uh, wipe the baby off, uh, suction them gently if we need to. Uh, and we need to keep the baby warm. Um, so we need to uh, get the baby out and let them down. Uh, we to generally do not rush into clamping the cords. Uh, current thought is you wait a minute or two so that uh, the baby can get some uh, extra blood uh, out of the uh, placenta, and then we're going to move on to clamp the cord. So once the baby's out, we're going to dry the baby with sterile towels or any towels that we have that are clean, uh, wrap the baby in a blanket, um, we're going to record the time of birth, and we're going to keep the baby warm. Remember, babies are little radiators, and they can lose their body heat very quickly. We're going to do an AP APGAR score. Uh, this is a way of evaluating the... Uh, baby's uh, condition at the time of birth. Uh, typically at the hospital we'll do them at one minute after delivery and five minutes after delivery. Um, there are five components to the APGAR. It has to do with the heart rate, uh, the respiratory effort, uh, muscle tone, uh, how irritable the patient is or the baby is, and their color. Uh, I think everybody understands that if the baby comes out and they're floppy with poor color and a poor pulse rate, um, they are, they are going to have some problems. Here's a graphic representation of the APGAR. Um, so the appearance, which is the A, uh, you know, they get zero points if they're uh, blue and pale. If uh, they're pink everywhere but the hands and feet, they get a one. And if they're pink everywhere, they get a two. Um, uh, the uh, pulse rate is the P in APGAR, and either the pulse rate is absent or it's less than 100 or over 100. You can assess the pulse rate just by grabbing the um, uh, umbilical cord and you can feel the pulse rate and determine what it is. Um, we also look at grimace which is the G for APGAR and that's what, how does the baby respond to suctioning. If they just don't do much um, that would be a zero. If they grimace or have not much of a response uh, that's a one. <coughs> Excuse me. If they become fussy, irritable, cough, uh, cry uh, with suctioning that would give them a two. Uh, activity is the A in um, APGAR. Uh, it has to do with uh, is the baby flaccid, 
do they uh, flex their arms and legs a little bit or do they actively flex uh, and contract their muscles but actively extends to uh, flex their extremities in which case we had a two uh, respiratory effort uh, is the r in apgar it has to do with uh, no respirations a very weak cry or a strong lusty cry that uh, is is very loud and easily heard so the maximal score on an APGAR is 10. Uh, minimal score is, or lowest score possible is zero. Uh, we like to know what they are. Generally, uh, we're happy with an APGAR of seven to 10 at one minute. And typically, uh, most babies are at a nine or 10 out of uh, 10 uh, by five minutes after birth. A little bit more on the umbilical cord. Uh, we want to handle it with care. Uh, we, we should wait a minute or two before we clamp it. And then we should clamp it, uh, you know, uh, four to five centimeters away from the uh, umbilicus of the baby. Um, you know, it, it, some babies need to have umbilical lines placed at the hospital, and if you have a little stub of an umbil umbilical cord, uh, it's hard for them to uh, to do at the hospital. Whereas if they have a couple inches of umbilical cord, uh, they can. Um, they can uh, have plenty of access to the vessels if they need to place a line. Uh, they can always make uh, the stump of the cord shorter at the hospital if they think you made it too long. But if you cut it too short, it's not like they can put it back on. So I'll leave about two inches or four to five centimeters from the umbilicus till your first clamp. You put a second clamp on, distal to the first, and then you cut in between. Um, and, uh, you know, you could also examine um, the uh, clamp and the cord that's still attached to the baby, make sure there's no ongoing bleeding. And then, uh, again, once, once you've got the cord clamp, keep the baby warm, wrap them up in a blanket. Um, after that, uh, patient's now entering the third phase of, of uh, labor. We're going to get that placenta delivered. Uh, you know, for us, there really shouldn't be a rush. Um, usually occurs within 20 minutes uh, after delivery. Uh, most of the time, it just comes out on its own, meaning you see another bulge in the perineum and with gentle traction on the uh, umbilical cord, it comes out. Uh, you can instruct the patient to bear down. Um, if you massage the uterus through the lower abdominal wall, just kind of put your hand above the uh, uh, symphysis pubis, kind of like you're overlying the bladder, and just gently massage the uterus. That will help the uterus uh, contract. Uh, by the uterus contracting, it will help expel um, the placenta, and it will also cause the uterus to contract and uh, cut back on the bleeding from, uh, from the uterus. So. Some uterine massage with your hand above the uh, symphysis pubis, just gently massaging the uterus. That uh, helps uh, expel the placenta and it helps control uh, postpartum bleeding. You take a look at the placenta. Um, one side, the baby side, will be shiny and gray. Those, those are the uh, amniotic membranes you're looking at. And on the mother's side, the side that's been attached to the uterus, that will be kind of dark and maroon colored. And uh, it looks kind of rough. Um, and you can also take a look and see if there's any pieces missing on the uh, maternal side. Uh, if there are holes in the placenta or uh, um, uh, pock marks in the placenta that would suggest that there may be some retained placenta and the obstetrician may need to do some procedures to get it out. Um, always bring the placenta with you to the hospital and um, uh, place the placenta in a bag or in, in uh, chucks or something to help uh, keep it uh, from uh, soiling uh, the truck and uh, everything else. And then uh, take the mother uh, and the baby to L&D and deliver the placenta on arrival. Uh, give it to the staff at a labor and delivery. After, um, after delivery, uh, we want to repeat the mom's vital signs. Uh, we want to uh, place a sanitary pad or a towel uh, over the uh, perineum to help control bleeding or at least catch the blood and uh, monitor the mother's condition closely. Uh, sometimes after delivery, uh, mothers can develop significant postpartum hemorrhage because the uterus doesn't constrict fully. Um, so you know, we want to monitor the amount of bleeding uh, and uh, you know develop some way of communicating how much bleeding has occurred. Patients use one pad, two pad, five pads uh, since delivery. Um, we've had to use two towels since delivery, just something that uh, helps quantify the volume of blood that's been lost. We also want to assess the fundus, again, feeling above the symphysis pubis uh, and uh, massage it if necessary. And then um, uh, we want to cover the mother with blankets, keep her warm as well. And mother uh, generally can have access to the baby. Um, you know, we have, um, we have uh, policies in place that say we're going to secure all passengers. We need to kind of achieve a balance between securing the baby for safe transport and allowing mother to hold on to the baby, uh, which is an important uh, period of bonding for the mother and the child. 
Uh, I've got a video that has to do, uh, or that I've found online that shows, uh, it's about a five minute video, shows uh, routine vaginal delivery. Um, uh, I'll play it along and as it goes, I'll, I'll give some overlying vocal comments. Uh, some of the interventions and things that you see are not appropriate for EMS. I'll point them out as they go. Uh, particularly, um, they talk about uh, placing an episiotomy, what well, we don't do episiotomies. And they also show suturing of the uh, perineum after delivery. That's not something we're going to do either. Uh, I think you, you already know that, but I just, I'll bring it up and I'll make comments as we go. So let's give this a try. I apologize for the music. It's what was embedded in the video. It's not what I would have picked out, um, but um, let's uh, spend five minutes uh, looking at the video. <laughs> This patient has been in labor for several hours. She's now completely dilated and ready to begin pushing. She holds her breath and bears down. The fetal head is deeply engaged in the pelvis. She will demonstrate the seven cardinal movements of labor. As she bears down, the fetal head becomes visible. Descent and flexion have already occurred. As the head descends further, it internally rotates. Now we can see the fetal head extend. An episiotomy has been made to facilitate delivery. The umbilical cord is wrapped loosely once around the neck. It is easily reduced. Then the head externally rotates. Dry the baby to prevent heat loss. I clear the baby's airway, nose and mouth using a suction device. Next, I clamp and cut the umbilical cord. A few minutes later, the afterbirth is expelled. Her 
vulva require just a few stitches. And here's that new baby. <laughs>